Well, amen. I hope you will take your copy of the scriptures and turn with me to Acts chapter 25, verses 13 through 27 this morning. We have been continuing on our journey with Paul, who has been experiencing some difficult times. And in all of his journeys, he has found himself now uh, put before governors, and we'll find out today, uh, kings, as he is defending the faith of Christ, um, as he continues to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout all of the world. Um, as we talked about before, and we'll continue to mention through the rest of this book, is that when we are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and faithfully proclaiming His name um, in a world that is insane and in total rebellion against God, it's going to lead to a bit of controversy. It's going to lead to some disagreements, perhaps even some persecution, because the world hates God. And the world especially hates Jesus Christ. They love the concept of a God, of something that they may uh, uh, make in their own image, and their own likeness, and things along those lines. But they hate the God of the Scriptures. They hate Jesus Christ as He has revealed Himself. Because by nature, we are uh, born into sin. And we are born into rebellion. And so whenever we proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus, when we proclaim His Lordship and His authority, his kingship, that the, a rebellious world that does not like to be the, under the authority of a king um, rebels against that. And so we are going to see some of that as we continue today. Uh, this is a, such an interesting passage of scripture with so many different things going on. Um, but as we start this morning, what I want us to remind ourselves of is the impending judgment. I think that... It's kind of interesting that before we even got to last week's um, passage of Scripture, where Paul is finding himself before uh, this governor, whose name is Festus, where we're going to see who he's continuing to be under and giving account to and giving defense of himself before him. Um, and then Agrippa today, we're going to see that as well. Is, is that when he was before Felix, when he was testifying before him uh, for, for a, you know, however many years, it says two years past, I don't know how much of that was under Fe Felix and, and Festus, it seems like the two years had to be with, with Felix, and it had to do with the fact that kind of daily he's continuing to cur converse with, with Felix, and he's talking to him about self-righteousness, uh, about righteousness, I'm sorry, about self-control, and about the coming judgment. And what we see here is that as Paul is standing before these various governors and kings, it's a reminder of the fact that as he's standing before them in judgment, we all will stand before the king of kings, the governor of governors, the potentate of potentates, and we will give account of ourselves before God in judgment. And so it's a reminder of how we ought to be living our lives. If Paul himself is able to give good uh, defense of himself before this, this governor, it's a reminder of the fact that he was going to stand before uh, someone much greater and much more powerful uh, than, than Festus, than Felix, than Agrippa. And it's a reminder to us as well. That as we give testimony, as we stand before people, as we continue to live our lives out for the sake of the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, that is a reminder of the fact that we will stand one day before Jesus Christ, who will reign over us in judgment and who, to whom we will give an account. And how this is just a picture, it's a type, it, it's, it's a reminder of these things. But I think one of the other things that's so satisfying and so lovely and so reassuring to us is also the reminder that the people before whom we stand will also stand, you see, before that great king, before Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so Christ himself told us things like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. And after that, they can do nothing else. But be afraid of the one who can cast both body and soul into hellfire. He says, beware of that. 
Give good testimony before the earthly kings, before the earthly governors and the powers and principalities, knowing that we will one day give account before the ultimate authority, the ultimate king, the ultimate judge. But I think it's so reassuring. We, it came up during our Sunday school time today. I was thankful for Jean mentioning, you know, praying for people who are, you know, difficult to pray for, people who are real enemies of God, people who are real enemies of the church. But one of the things that terrifies me for those people who today are, 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 are pushing so many things that God hates and flooding our culture with the things that God despises is how terrifying it will be for them on that day of judgment. It will be so terrifying for them. And it, it, that, in a way, it sort of, it, it, it breaks my heart for them. I fear for them. Because imagine, imagine your, 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 your president of Planned Parenthood standing before God, before the righteous judge, Think of those who are, who are propping up, you know, Pride Month in June and, and, and things along those lines. Think of the, the, the owners of all of the various pornography websites that are out there. And the day that they will stand before the holy and righteous judge of all the earth. Think of how terrifying it will be for them on that day. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And I think that helps us to put some things in perspective. That instead of wishing somebody would come under the judgment of the wrath of God, or, or wishing that somebody would experience that, we, we might suddenly have a little bit of, of pity toward them. Or a little bit of, of love and the hope that they might repent. Because surely it's going to be terrifying for them on that day of judgment. But only does that, not only does that help us to, to have a little bit of compassion for those people who surely are, are uh, what's awaiting for them is a terrible, terrible righteous judgment against them. It also reminds us that we ourselves will also stand before that great righteous and perfect judge. That we ourselves will also give account of ourselves to God. And it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So as we get into our text this morning, as we think about this this morning, I want us to come to this text sober-minded. As we think about the great injustice that's being done to Paul, and how Paul must have thought to himself of the great injustice that's being done, and how great injustices may be done to us throughout, throughout our, our lives. I'm still mad at the Springfield Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Adam. I really, really am. Um, because of their ridiculous standard that they, that they put on people. But, but I think about that, that even in the enduring of the unjust things that happen to us in this world, enduring all of the things that come our way that we didn't really deserve that came our way, a reminder of the fact that in the economy of God, who is the righteous judge of all the earth, they'll give account for that to him. And we can trust in these things. And it helps us to surrender upon the, the sovereignty and the grace of God, knowing that we deserve that same righteous condemnation upon ourselves as well. So stand with me this morning as we continue this wonderful chapter of Acts chapter 25, looking at verses 13 through 27. Stand with me as we read God's word together. <clears throat> now when some days had passed, this is verse 13, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. 
I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up any one before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day I took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I had supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who is dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and try, be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving of death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write about my uh, write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. This is the word of the Lord given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and penned by the servant of God, Luke. May you receive it with the full authority and measure of weight that it carries, because this is the word of God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would give us insight and understanding into the scriptures this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would open our minds to understand what's being written to, or said, spoken to us or written here, Lord, and open our hearts to receive your word this morning. May we not be blinded in our eyes and deaf in our ears, Lord, but may we hear and see and understand all that you have for us, Lord. I pray that I would not do any damage or violence to an understanding of the scripture today, but would faithfully preach in accordance with the correct interpretation and understanding of scripture today. Give me the words to speak, and when you're finished, close my mouth, I pray, Lord. And we pray that in all things, that the Holy Spirit would move in our midst this morning, convicting us all of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when some days had passed, I love how uh, Luke just continues to keep giving these, li these little things. I don't know how many days that was, but we know that it's some days. <laughs> we know that in passing, Luke mentioned in the last week, um, at the beginning of this chapter, he said, now when two years had passed, and how, how it was just wild to think about. He just glosses over this fact that, it, by the way, it's two years later, you know. Meanwhile, Paul has been unjustly and unrighteously imprisoned for two years um, under false accusations. And so we see that 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 we Paul is continuing in this. He's being handed sort of from emperor to emperor and brought before king after king and things like that. And and he's given this defense um, as he is testifying to Christ uh, before emperors be, or excuse me, before governors, before kings and before an emperor by it, all that is said and done. In fact, we find that he will find himself in a Roman prison uh, as he writes these these epistles uh, like Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians and Philemon and he's talking about the time that he spent in this Roman prison in Rome but all the household of Caesar all these people are coming to faith in Christ because he can't shut Paul up and he's not going to stop talking to people about Jesus and so God used this very difficult and uh, 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 you know probably not what Paul had
ahead imagine what he would be doing in order to testify uh, about Christ. But he found himself to be faithful. And it's just a great reminder to us to no matter what situation in which we find ourselves, whether through freedom or whether through compulsion or whether through imprisonment or, or even persecution, that we may continue to always be faithful in our walk before the Lord and can continue to be faithful in, in proclaiming the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ and that salvation that's through Christ Jesus alone, that Jesus Christ is the king. So we, it says some days had passed and Paul is still there with Festus and this guy by the name of Grippa, the king, and this woman by the name of Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. Now, there's a whole lot going on here in this one little verse that I want to unpack uh, here. When you see the word Agrippa the king and Bernice, you probably assume this is a husband and wife. Uh, it's not a husband and wife. It's a brother and a sister. But in a kind of gross, disgusting, icky way, they're sort of living together as a husband and a wife. So that's really disgusting. And it's also a reminder of the fact that we do all manner of immorality and um, as people who are born in sinfulness, right? That, that why does it say in the book of Levit Leviticus, don't marry your sister and don't marry a goat and don't do all of these various things is because in our fallen, depraved, sinful selves, we do those things. And we see it clearly uh, in our culture today, don't we? How we license all manner of immorality, all manner of sin, both homosexual, heterosexual, and any other strange way that we find that articulated in our culture. That's what happens when you remove the Word of God. That's what happens when people don't know. Or, or even if they do know the Word of God, they just simply rebel against it. It's just a reminder that that's the reason why we have to be told these things. Because otherwise, in our sinful selves, we, we imagine and invent all manner of wickedness and evil. And there's nothing that holds us back from our great depravity. In fact, at one point in time, the world had become so depraved that God said, flood it and start over, basically. You see, we are, we are just limitless. We are boundless in our ability to continue to invent ways uh, uh, to perform evil and wicked things uh, in this world. In fact, it says that in Romans chapter 1. That it says, it even mentions this one little phrase, Paul says, inventors of evil. It's like all the evil that's there isn't good enough. But we find ways to go varsity on this stuff, right? And go like even further and push the boundary. It's like every parent who talks about give your kids an inch and they'll take a mile. Well, we're just grown up ki sinful kids. And if we're not, you know, if we're given any inch whatsoever, we'll take it and we'll run to the extreme. We'll just take these things and do this. So we find ourselves here in the midst of uh, a Roman governor and what is sort of a sort of quasi-Jewish, probably it's more closely Idumean, um, uh, a king, this guy by the name of Agrippa, who is currently shacking up with his sister in an incestuous relationship. But here we are, we find them there, and here's Paul, the righteous one, this righteous man of God living for Jesus, uh, uh, standing before these pagan, disgusting people, these immoral pagan and, and uh, sexually immoral people. And so he is going to give his defense before these people. What we also know about Agrippa is that he's this word Agrippa uh, um, it might be something that quickly uh, um, illuminates your mind to, I've heard this name before, okay? This is the second Agrippa, son of the first Agrippa, who, um, who is also the son of another Herod, who's the son of another Herod. So his great grandpa is the one who murdered all the children in Bethlehem trying to kill the tri Christ child, okay? His grandfather is the one who beheaded John the Baptist. Okay? His father is the one who martyred James. He murdered James and imprisoned Peter, the one that was eaten by worms as he was struck dead. And so this is the lineage of this guy. And he has learned everything uh, from his heritage and continues to perpetuate his gross 
immorality. And so we find this here, that he is, uh, he's a king, he's sort of like this region, sort of the northwest of where, of where Festus is, and he's reigning there, and so he's coming in to meet this prisoner. And so we're going to find, um, I guess we'll skip down to the very end, and we'll come back to this, okay? In verse 27, it says, for me, or for it seems unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Sorry, I meant to go to verse 26. But I had nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, we may have something to write. Remember, Paul's appealed to Caesar. He's seen that he's not getting a fair trial. He's not getting a fair shake. And so he, he enlists his Roman citizenship and he takes hold of the rights that have been granted to him and he uses them for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. And he appeals to Caesar so he can get a fair trial. Well, the problem is, is that Festus still has no idea what's going on. Like, like in all of these things, in fact, we read that through here, that Festus mentions like, I thought this guy was like some kind of an insurrectionist or something. I thought that he's leading revolts or, or, or leading rebellions or something along those lines. And, and the Jews are so mad at him uh, that they're trying to like get him taken care of. So that way, you know, because he's been doing all these violent crimes or rebellions or something along those lines. Uh, we're going to see that it mentions that it's like, it's not that, it's just something about their law. You know, so, so he's saying, so this guy, Paul, he's appealed to Caesar and I need to send him to Caesar, but I have no idea what to write. I can't just like send this guy to the emperor and say, well, he appealed to you, but I don't really know what's going on. So that would not look good on Festus. So he's trying to do his due diligence. So in verse 26, it gives us a reason for why King Agrippa is there. And the reason why is because though he is an Idumean king who's the son of reprobates and more reprobates, he also happens to be sort of understanding the Jewish culture and heritage. He's kind of an expert on Jewish culture and understanding of things. So because of that, uh, um, you know, uh, knowledge, experience of dealing with Jewish people, and Festus is just this Roman governor guy who doesn't understand all of these things, he brings King Agrippa and Bernice in in order to sort of like cover his own tail and make sure that he has something to send to the emperor that makes any, any, any sense. You see, so that's what's happening here is that that's the sort of the great context of what's happening. But let's look at some of the details within the context of what's happening. Verse 14, it mentions they stayed there many days and Festus laid Paul's case before the king saying, there's a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for sentence of condemnation against him. This is all rehash of last week, right? So this is everything we talked about last week. He's conveying it to Agrippa now. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had an opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge that was laid against him. So that's a, you know, that's a little bit of a fudging of things. We also know that he, he uh, also wanted to do the Jews a favor, so he left them in prison and all of these things like that. So, so we know that he was going to like send Paul down there, who was also going to get murdered on his way remember there was a plot against them and Paul appeals to Caesar understanding the times and having discernment and so he appeals here and so that's where we find what's happening here so when they came together I made no delay but on the next day took my seat in the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought when the accuser stood up they brought no charge in his case uh, of such evils as I supposed and so that's the idea you see he's thinking who is this guy Paul and was he, what's he stirring up? You know, it's like he's understanding now that the laws that, that Paul broke in the minds of the Jews had nothing to do with the laws of Rome. That he's not stirring up rebellion. He's not a murderer. He's not a thief. He's not, uh, he's not you know, this is not a civil matter. This is a church matter, basically, is the idea. Remember we saw this guy... Um, Gaius, um, a few chapters earlier, how how there was a riot that was being stirred up, and and they're like, well, the courts are open if there's some other thing, but this is just something about their God, you know, we can't imprison him or beat him or something along these lines because he hasn't actually broken any laws. You see, 
according to the civil sphere and the civil sta- standard of things. Which is a great reminder to us that as much as possible, we ought to be um, <clears throat> law-keeping people. That we shouldn't be known for being revelers. We shouldn't be known for, for breaking the laws of the land. That, that we may not like the laws that are imposed upon us, but as people who have been called to be in submission to the authority of Christ, we've also been commanded to be in submission to the authority that Christ has established on the earth. And that is the government. Um, I'm excited for the next couple of weeks. If you haven't been to Sunday school, um, Bible study time, maybe not next week, I don't know, Russ, uh, but maybe the week after we're going to get to Romans chapter 13, which is that great um, discourse about how Paul outlines and identifies that the government is not something that is opposed to God, but the government is something that God has ordained. That he gave it because he's a God of law and order. He's a God of keeping things in order. And so Paul had such a good testimony here as being a law and order sort of person following the laws of the Romans that that Felix couldn't find anything wrong with him according to the laws of the civil government. Okay, And it's a great reminder to us that we need to be known as people who are living peaceable under the laws of the land. We ought to be that. Now, having said that, and I'm just qualifying this for the sake of qualifying this. I'm not arguing from the exception here. But, the, but there are times when the law of the land goes against the law of God, and we ought not to obey the law of the land whenever that comes. Okay? I always want to make that qualification. I always want to make that exception. Because there are some things. If, if you are commanded, uh, suppose you're serving in the military, and you're commanded to shoot these innocent people, and you're like, in conscience, I can't do that. And you go to the stock or the brig or whatever the, the, the nomenclature is for that. You know, if, you, if you're court-martialed for directly disobeying your superior officer, but you did so because you're obeying God's law over the law of that, then that's, that's a good showing. Okay, that's a good testimony for Christ. Okay, there are times when we are to obey the law of the land. But generally, we as the people of God ought not to be known as rebellious People, we ought to be known as law-abiding people. And we shouldn't be known for mouthing off and flying off the handle and being uh, 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 contentious in the way that we live. But we should be known for obeying the laws of land so much as we can, right? That we may live peaceable, working with our hands and, and raising our families and doing these things. Okay, so we see this here that 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 Paul had such good testimony here that the only thing that was brought against them was something that the Jews actually did. Not Paul. He didn't stir up the riot. It was the Jewish people that stirred up the riots against him. And so he's seen clearly that Paul's Paul doesn't seem to be guilty here. All right, so it says they stood up, they brought no charge in this case of such evils as I suppose. Verse 19, rather they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Now, this is where it gets really cool, really interesting. Because what I think we're going to see here is a beginning of a juxtaposition about who the important people are in this story and who the important people aren't, right? Firstly, I want us to see that it's a great reminder that we ought not to assume that people around us know who Jesus is. We ought not to assume that people around us know the gospel. This is the governor of the province of, you know, he's in Caesarea, so he's the governor of a province probably of Judea, which the church is there. It's alive. It's well. It's present. We know that Philip the evangelist found himself in Caesarea, and a great church is there, right in Festus' own city. And yet Festus himself is like, yeah, it's about some guy named Jesus, who, like, the Jews are like, no, he's dead. But Paul's like, no, no, he rose from the dead. See, Festus is the most important man in that whole province, and he had no idea who Jesus was. So we ought not to assume that just because we live in a Bible beltish southwestern Missouri sort of area, that people around us actually know who Jesus is. 
that they actually know what the gospel is. And so we need to be diligent and not assuming that people know Christ and, and, and not assuming that people know the gospel, but in assuming that they don't know Christ and assuming that they don't know the gospel. I think of, I think it was D.L. Moody talked about, I always imagine on people's forehead written was the word lost. And I always assumed they were lost until I got a chance to talk to them about Jesus to know whether they were saved or not. Don't go around thinking that because you're faithful in the church and, under, and you're listening to good teaching and good preaching and understand the gospel and understand good theology and things like that, don't think that people around you do. Your co-workers, wherever you're working, they probably don't. The people, your family members, your neighbors, they probably don't know who Jesus is. They probably don't have a good understanding. They probably don't understand the gospel. And it's up to us to portray the gospel to them so that they might repent and come to faith in Christ. Here's this guy, super important guy. No idea who Jesus was. So we mustn't assume that. But what we're also going to see here is this really interesting uh, 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 a picture of like, like the world versus the kingdom of God. And in the economy of God, the things that are of value and the things that are fleeting. Um, let's just get into it. This is so cool. So as he, as he mentions that, uh, but being at a loss at how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until he could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So, so that's, that's, that's the build up for the day, right? So we're only going to get to the first part of it. We're not even getting to the, the meat of it, which is next week when we're going to look at Paul giving his defense before Agrippa. But what we're going to see here is this very fascinating, play that comes out here. So it says the next day, Agrippa and Bernice, with great pomp, <laughs> they entered the audience hall with military tribunes and the prominent men of the city, and then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. So imagine this scene. Let it play out in your mind, right? They're coming in, there's trumpets blowing. There, the military people are marching in. It says there's military tribunes come in. There's great fanfare. There's great accolade. There's great promotion of Agrippa and Bernice and Festus as they all come in. Why? Because they thought they were extremely important people. And they had to loudly and brashly and put it on this big billboard for everybody to see we're important. Pay attention to us. Come walking in. And then imagine this. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. With no fanfare. In chains, we're going to find out from the next chapter. Probably in ruddy clothes, scraggy clothes, maybe disheveled hair. Maybe he's got a beard. By now, he's not able to shave or anything because he's been in jail. He's been in house arrest. Maybe it wasn't quite that bad. But here's this guy, Paul, who's brought in in humility. He's brought in in lowliness. He's brought in, in, in with no fanfare, with no trumpets, with no glory, with nothing. But who's remembered in the annals of history? Who, are the, who is the great one in this scene for real? In God's eyes, you see. I think about this. We wouldn't even know who Festus and Agrippa were if it wasn't for the fact that this story appears here in maybe some of Josephus' writings. That, that if you were to ask Agrippa and, and Bernice and Festus, who were the important ones in that courtroom proceeding, do you think any one of them would have said it was Paul? They would have all pointed to themselves. And they loudly championed themselves with great pomp, with great uh, exaltation of self. 
But what does Christ say in the scriptures? Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so whose name is it that we hear throughout all of history? Recorded in the scriptures. You know, the only reason their names are here is because Paul is in the story, you see? And I think about that, 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 that how many times in the scripture does it say things like, let not us think too highly of ourselves. How we even talked about this during our, our Sunday school time, that, that, that we should do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above ourselves. Think about how, how, um, how it says in, in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. And then think of that, that same passage from Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, yet humbled himself. He emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant, and he humbled himself and was obedient even to the point of death and death on the cross. The one who is highest of all, the supreme Lord and God of all creation, King Jesus, humiliated himself to the uttermost place of humiliation. But God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, those on the earth and above the earth and under the earth and everywhere else, that, that they may, that they may uh, bow the knee to Christ and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, he who was highly exalted and most humble was most highly exalted, again, you see, to the place of all authority and dominion and power. See, in the economy of God, he, Jesus Christ said things like, if you don't, don't lord yourself over people like the heathen like to do. Don't make yourself powerful and prominent and, and, and lord your authority of people. If you want to be a real leader, if you want to know what real authority is, you go and be servant of all. You see, in, in, in this economy of God, he often juxtaposes these things. He, he says things like, if you're looking to receive, 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 you're never going to be filled. But if you want to receive, you give. Instead of thinking how, how you can look for other people to pour into you, Think about how you can be pouring into other people. Why? Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. See, God's always doing these paradoxes that go against our natural uh, uh, thinking about things. If you want to live, you need to die. That no one can come after me. No one can come after me unless first he takes up his cross and dies to himself. And follows me. See, we have this all over the scripture. If you really want to live, you have to die. If you really want to receive, you have to give. If you really want to be granted authority, you need to serve. And so we see Paul here, who in the eyes of everybody in that room was nothing, but in the eyes of God was the most important person in that room. Christ himself said to Pilate on the day he was crucified, do you not think that I could call, or no, it was whenever he was being arrested in the garden, I think, do you not think that I could call 10,000 legions of angels <laughs> to come to my side? But I do this that the scripture may be fulfilled. See, Christ never sought his own, but he always sought the glory of God the Father, you see. And that's what we've been called to do. Not to seek our own position, not to seek our own place, not to seek our own authority, not to seek our own glory, but to, in all ways, in all things, to seek the glory of Christ to the glory of God the Father. Even the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when He comes, He won't testify of Himself, but He'll testify of me. See, see the Holy Spirit testifies of Christ. Christ. 
And then Christ testifies of the Father. And you see this wonderful picture that's been given to us how God himself in the Godhead sort of emulates what he's calling all of us to do. You glorify me, and I'll glorify you, you see? It's always about how we to die to ourselves and to humiliate ourselves so that God may exalt us in his own time. And we trust him in his glory and in the way that he sees things. And that's why I sort of started this entire thing with a reminder and understanding of we all stand before a sovereign God, a sovereign judge who sees all of these things. He sees how you've been wronged. He sees how you've been humiliated. He sees when you've been brought low. He sees. It, he's the God who sees. El Roe, right? The God who sees. So we can trust him that in our humiliation, know that he's going to exalt you in due time. That we trust these things, that, that I can endure all of these things because I know that God sees. And I have not just a temporal right now mindset, but I've got a far-reaching mindset, an eternal mindset, so that even in this life, if I don't receive, you know, the reward for my suffering, so to speak, I know that I will. Because, because we don't look in just the here and now. We don't just look in the temporal things. We look for the glory of His kingdom and look at eternal things. And so that's why we're able to live in this day like this, because we know in that day, we'll have good showing before the Lord. Praise God. And then on that day, we'll re be reminded of the fact <laughs> that even the fact that we're standing before Him is only because of His grace. It's only because of what He's done for us. Why are we able to love? Because He first loved us. Why are we able to give? Because He gave us life and the ability to do so. How are you able to work your job? Because he gave you the ability to do so. Everything's from him. So everything is to him. And everything is for his glory. And even when we go through these light momentary afflictions, as he says, we can trust in the fact that he is ordering all things according to his glory. And, the, and for the love and the goodness of the people who trust in him, you see. Because we know that even in this moment, this moment in Paul's life, that humiliated prisoner wrought before the great fanfare of all these people who were exalting themselves. Paul saw in that moment that God was working that moment out for his good because of God who loves him, you see. And he's working out all of these things. Then we can trust in the fact that we don't have to loud ourselves. Laud, loud, however you say it. We don't have to laud ourselves. We don't have to boast in our own doings. We don't have to, you know, uh, put a billboard up about all the things that we're doing for the Lord. We do it in the quiet. We do it in the secret. We do it in all these things. And what God sees in secret, He will exalt publicly. In fact, <laughs> Jesus even said, if you go around boasting about all those things you're doing, and if you stand on the street corner and pray loud prayers so that you may be seen, my men, congratulations, that is the extent of your reward. You will receive nothing else from that. We don't trust in, 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 in the temporal blessings here and now. We don't trust in the temporal exaltations of here and now. But we look forward to that day, and we live and endure these things for the sake of the kingdom of God. So in verse 25, um, excuse me, verse 24, and Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with you, uh, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving of death, and he himself appealed to the emperor. I decided to go ahead and send him. Good idea, Festus. Okay. So we see how even in the midst of all of this, even though Paul is in chains, he's being kept alive by the providence of God, even through the decisions of Festus that he's making there, you see. And he's gonna and Paul is going to go to Rome. He will go to Rome because Jesus said so a few chapters back when he appeared to him. He said, So he's orchestrating all these things for the glory of God. So Paul, resting in that wonderful promise, just continues to, all right, here's another opportunity. So I and I've, I, Paul's been promoted to giving defense of Christ from governor 
to giving defense of Christ before a king. How awesome is that? So as Paul is beginning, is he staying faithful, even in his humiliation, think about that. Think about how wonderful it is that he is able to give testimony of Christ as he continues to go through. Now, I've already went through that last portion of Scripture, but this is all in preparation for what we're going to go through next week because Paul then is going to take this wonderful opportunity and he's going to testify of Christ again. Okay? His whole heart and his whole mind is simply focused on the kingdom of God. So my question and my challenge to us this morning, are we worried about being seen in front of others? Are we worried about having our rewards and our lauding, our, uh, uh, um, what we've been doing paraded so that way other people might see and pat us on the back for the things that we've been doing? Are we doing these things for the sake of the kingdom of God? Are we doing these things knowing that even if nobody else sees, I know God does, and he who sees in secret will reward openly. Are we doing things for that sake? Are we doing things for our own recognition? Are we doing things in the hopes of the kingdom of God and being seen by Him, you see? I am a sinner. And I am a person who likes a pat on the back. I'm a like, uh, I'm a, I'm, I'm just a little kid who's still a little boy saying, looking for somebody to say, attaboy, Steve, you know, I'm still that guy. Uh, and, and, and that's something that we have to fight all the time, self-seeking and self-glory, you see. Um, and so I'm, I'm issuing this challenge and this admonition and this encouragement to all of you as I'm doing the same thing to myself. Because I like to be seen. I like to be to, for people to recognize the things that I've done. And, and I don't want that to be the extent of my reward. And I hope that all of us in this room would feel the same way. And the second challenge I want to make is that continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere you go and every, every time you can. And don't assume that people know the gospel. Don't assume that people knew, know Jesus. Jesus was, you know, a, you know, just a couple, you know, maybe 20 years before this time and his popularity had gone throughout the entire Roman Empire and there are major churches in the very province of Festus and yet Festus, the most important man there, had no idea. He had no idea until Paul told him about him. So don't assume that. Don't assume that people around you Know who Christ is and know the gospel. Be faithful to continue to preach in the hopes that they may repent and trust in Christ. And then the third challenge I want to say is, I don't assume everyone in here knows Jesus. I don't know. I don't know your hearts. I can only assume that you being here know Christ and have placed your faith and trust in Christ. But I don't know if you're trusting in Christ or not. So I plead with you, And I implore you this morning, be reconciled to God. Repent. Trust in Christ that you may be rescued from your sin, from the judgment of God. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this incredible passage of Scripture and the reminders that we see throughout, Lord, of the good testimony of Paul. We didn't even get to hear him start today. I know we will next week, but even in this moment, Lord, there's so much going on. And how you orchestrate all these things according to your sovereign hand and gave Paul the opportunity to be humiliated that you may reward him greatly. And we know, we know, Lord, that great was his reward in the kingdom of heaven. That we remember in, at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4, he fought the good fight. He kept the faith. He finished the race, and He did so in faithfulness by Your grace for Your glory. I just pray that for every person in this room, that we also in this room stay steadfast, stay focused to keep fighting that good fight, to keep running this race, to keep the faith, Lord, as we continue walking for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. Help us, Lord, to continue to proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus for your glory and for your grace, Lord. And lastly, I do pray, I do pray, if there's someone in here who has not trusted in Christ, may today be the day 
that they repent, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you please pierce their heart and bring them to utter conviction and fear of hell and judgment that they may repent and trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. Thank you for your grace and your faithfulness. Thank you for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now, Father, as we are about to come to your table, what a wonderful privilege we have to tangibly proclaim the broken body and the shed blood of Christ Jesus our Lord, which is poured out for us as for, for the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. Thank you, Father, and please uh, give us grace, Lord, to dine well with Christ this morning at his table. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.